Welcome to Close Listening. I'm Zach Morgenstern, joined as always by silent co-host Ludwig von Pee. So I recently went to see Paul Thomas Anderson's movie, Licorice Pizza. It's a good movie, maybe a bit long if you're not a film buff, but not too long. We're not talking The Irishman or anything. And it features two rookie actors, Cooper Hoffman, the son of the late great Philip Seymour Hoffman, and Alana Haim. Both gave charismatic performances. And so when I heard that Alana Haim wasn't just some nobody, but the member of a successful band, I grew curious. So Alana is part of a band called Haim, and it is a band of three sisters, Danielle, Esti, and Alana. So originally they were in a covers band where their dad Mozi and their mother Donna were a drummer and a guitarist. Uh, Fleetwood Mac is a big influence of theirs. The sisters all play multiple instruments and sing. So I was intrigued and I ended up getting copies of all three of their records. Days Are Gone, Something to Tell You, and Woman in Music, Volume 3. Yet, when I started listening to their debut record, Days Are Gone, I experienced, I guess, what you would call culture shock. Oh, I said, this is a pop record. Now, I'll be the first guy to tell you that genre is a construct made up by the music industry to sell records and historically to reinforce racial segregation as well. At the same time, I was that snobby kid when I was growing up who was like, why are they playing all this James Blunt and Sean Paul and Britney Spears at the school dance? I want rock and roll, man. So through the years, I've kind of fluctuated, I guess, on this question of whether I truly don't like pop music or whether I'm just what gets called derisively a rockist, someone who applies an arbitrary blanket critique to a broad swath of music unfairly, you know, dismissing it as pop, you know, some would say because it is a female dominated genre, whereas rock was historically a male dominated genre. That said, when I was 16, I discovered Rick Astley uh, and my mother teased me at the time. She said, you're turning into a pop fan. And through the years, I've come to like plenty of songs by musicians who are considered poppy, you know, Michael Jackson, Wham, Prince, Cyndi Lauper, Madonna. I really like the song Rhythm of the Night by DeBarge. Amongst contemporary artists, the weekend's music reminds me of swimming through a neon lit up swimming pool. Like, there's no doubt, that's a pretty cool feeling. So what I tried to take from this experience of listening to Haim, a group I was predisposed to like at first, and then I had that visceral reaction, ooh, this is pop, was trying to put into words what I actually don't like about pop. Because I feel like with Haim, I have these competing feelings. On the one hand, yes, I have this anti-pop bias, but if I'm gonna like any pop group, it's this group of three sisters who really play instruments, who really sing, who do cool harmonies together, and one of them was in a great indie movie. If I'm gonna be biased against any pop music, it's not this. And yet I heard the pop elements and I'm like, ugh, I really don't like this. Uh, so one thing that just frustrated me as a reviewer of this music is I wasn't able to discern the three sisters had really distinct sounds or roles in the band. If you look at the credits, it'll just say who sings, but it doesn't say who the primary singer is, for instance. Uh, it, it, it won't, all the songs are credited to all three of them, as, as far as I remember, so you don't get a sense of them as distinct voices. So as the result, psychologically, I was listening to Haim, and especially when the sisters are singing together in harmony, their instinct seems to be to sing kind of softly. And admittedly, this is not uncommon amongst harmony singers. And in my limited experience, this is also what I haven't liked about Crosby, Stills, and Nash's music. So you have this family band of three talented ex singers. You, you expect three vibrant voices, but all the voices are suppressed for the sake of some greater beautiful harmony. And then this is where the pop problem really comes in. A lot of their songs, especially on this first record, Days Are Gone, are overwhelmed by drum machines and the synths. Yes, you have the sisters singing their soft little harmonies and playing their instruments, but these digital elements overwhelm them. Now, let me be clear, digital music, digital additions to music can be fun. I just put out a record where I experimented with that kind of thing that I called pop, pop, pop. I was playing with my own pop sign. But those kind of pop accents belong when they match the melodramatic vocals, the melodramatic energy of a song. So take Belinda Carlisle's Heaven is a Place on Earth. It's clear that song is A, supposed to be over the top, and B, it's not supposed to be taken too seriously. Uh, meanwhile, in Phil Collins' In the Air Tonight, a slightly more serious song, and also a major influence on the sound of Haim, uh, particularly the gated drumming, uh, Phil, Phil Collins sings with this mournful, distinct, apocalyptic voice that is the central thing in the production. Despite the really loud drums, despite the synths, you don't listen to a Phil Collins song and miss on the uniqueness of his voice. 
But that's exactly the problem with Haim. They might be very interesting songwriters, they might be a lot of talent, but you hear the pop elements more than you hear them. And in fairness, this isn't a problem that's just limited to modern pop. In my critique of the Bee Gees debut Baroque pop al album called Bee Gees First, I argued the problem was not that they use orchestral instruments, because again, I like a lot of musicians who, who incorporate orchestral instruments into their sound, but rather that it seemed to be the orchestra was playing these full blast classical arrangements, regardless of what the underlying Bee Gees song was. There was no buildup. The songs always came on with orchestral full blast. And the Bee Gees, ironically, another sibling trio, another very talented sibling trio, just let the production overwhelm what was them. And that's essentially the same problem that Haim has, especially on the Days Are Gone album. Their songs are drowned out by this nightclub sound. Now, who knows why they did it? Perhaps it's a sound they genuinely wanted, and I just have different sonic tastes than them. Perhaps it was a natural progression from the fun of experimenting with sound editing in what was apparently GarageBand. Or perhaps they felt that bringing in those big songs, pop sounds was a compromise that they needed to make to be commercial. Now, I might not necessarily be the right person to judge this. So I absolutely hate that nightclub sound because I associate clubs with crowds, impossible to hear conversations, Headaches. I also don't like the taste of alcohol. A lot of people, by contrast, have positive associations with going to clubs and drinking and partying. But I think from an objective perspective, the experience you expect from three sisters singing is three voices, a real relationship building between them. But when you have one single computer, one single drum machine, it's just one big person or one big non-person, it cancels the individuality of that all out. It doesn't matter if you have three sisters or 10 sisters or one sister, you know, the power of those voices means nothing when they're put on an equal footing with this electric non-person. That said, despite my listening experience with Haim making it impossible to like any one album in full, I do want to emphasize that there were some songs that managed to pull through and really appear to me. Uh, Little of Your Love on their second album, I thought worked really well. It had a distinct, catchy chorus. And I thought they had quite a few decent songs on their third album, Women in Music 3. So uh, the first song on the album is called Los Angeles, and it turns LA into the city. And it subverts that trope of LA being the city where dreams come true, where people go to be movie stars and have fun and party into a song about a dreary hometown, just like any other. And I imagine that's how people who actually live in LA experience LA. These days I can't see no visions. I'm breaking, losing my faith, the song goes. Track two, The Steps, is really good. It has a great buildup to this memorable chorus, which speaks to a very relatable frustration. You, uh, an individual, are working on something you're not very good at, and you're really proud of the progress you're making, yet people will put you down just because you aren't quite there yet. And then they have a song called Gasoline, which kind of builds on the, the vision in Prince's Little Red Corvette. And it's a nice catchy title because gasoline is something that's disgusting. You know, it pollutes the air and smells terrible, yet they turn it into this lustful little love song. Time's second and third albums, Something to Tell You and Women in Music 3, correct what I think are the worst excesses of digital drumming on Days Are Gone. But there are still pop choices that I think suppress the power of them as songwriters and as voices. Quite often, they cram long phrases into beats, another kind of pop inflection. Uh, and while these long phrases are not a, a, a rhythmic, like they don't sound non-musical, the result of cramming all those words together in that poppy way is that the words no longer become about saying something. They become just more about a rhetorical instrument. For example, in the opening track on Something to Tell You, Want You Back, that they sing the choruses, I want you back. Like, I want you. All, you know, three words that could be so mournful, that's so expressive. They just become this one little united, almost passionless punch. That song could be all with longing, and instead it just becomes another beat played in the nightclub. So in short, pop is a loosely defined term. If you look at what iTunes defines pop as, it's much broader than I've even explained it as today. I think most people would think of pop as synth and drum machine heavy music that started in, in the 80s, but the term predates that, you know, singer songwriter music from the 60s and 70s and some jazzy stuff earlier, you know, as long as it wasn't hard rock or instrumental jazz often got categorized as pop. 
So if you have a blanket allergy to anything called pop, you're going to miss out on a lot of good and interesting music because people can use all kinds of instruments to be expressive. People of all kinds from all backgrounds, to state the obvious, can make great music. That said, don't assume that all of your anti-pop bias is just a, a stupid, baseless thought, because I think there are things that happen in the process that try and popify modern music that does truly damage it. So when pop means the suppression of expression, the drowning out of voices with familiar pulsing, headache-inducing drum machine beats, that's not a good thing. And in, in the case of a band like this, which clearly has a lot of talent, I just wonder how much better they would be if they went for a truly acoustic album or even just found a way to, dot, to dial back the pop choices one more level. Well, let me know what you think. Have you ever had an anti-pop bias? How do you think about your anti-pop bias? Do you think it adds up or it's just you're a crust? I like old music and I don't like young music. How would you explain it? Let us know in the comments below. I'm Zach Morgenstern. This is Ludwig von B. See you next time. Mm -hmm.